Gentlemen, today we're going to broach a topic that YouTube doesn't particularly appreciate, but YouTube does like product review videos, so we're going to pretend to review the iFlyTech SR302 Voice Recorder Pro, which is an AI-powered dictation tool. And the other thing that YouTube loves is movie reviews. So we will, of course, be talking about the 1994 film Clear and Present Danger. That's right. This is T-Rex Labs. Now, as you have probably guessed, I want to begin this product review by pointing out that the world that we live in is black and white. It is totally binary, right and wrong. There is no neutrality and there is no neutral gray area. Now, the world looks gray in the same way that this shirt looks gray. But if you look closely at the shirt, you will actually see that it is individually black and white threads. There's no gray here at all, which you notice if you look close enough. And on that note, let's begin talking about the iFlyTech voice recorder here. Uh, you may not be familiar with this company. This is a pretty small piece of electronic technology with uh, a name like that. You might assume that it's some random fly-by-night Chinese company that pops up, puts two or three products on Amazon, and then rebrands. But no, iFlyTech is actually a huge company. They have over 10,000 engineer employees. Uh, they have five or 600 million clients, uh, most of which are in China, but they make really powerful voice recognition tools for a huge amount of internet infrastructure on, well, basically just the other half of the world. The SR302 is a really nifty voice recorder. It is super simple, no Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth, no cloud nonsense. It's got directional microphones, feels pretty solid in the hand, decent battery life, clicky buttons, a touchscreen. But the cool bit is when you record audio, it transcribes it uh, instantly and in real time totally offline. And I realize that there's going to be nothing but complaints and uh, arguments in the comments section between Americans and Chinese people and America versus China. Just, you know, get in there, get it over with uh, while I test this thing for its speed and its accuracy. The phone is running Google's offline keyboard and the iFlyTech recorder is using its own offline algorithm. To be perfectly honest, I'm pretty impressed by the little voice recorder because it has considerably less processing power than the flagship Samsung phone. And it's not just capable of doing this in English. There are several languages loaded onto this little tiny thing. There is Russian, Japanese, Korean, Mandarin Chinese, and then some other Chinese dialects, which is why we're talking about iFlyTech in the first place. As you probably know, Mandarin Chinese is pretty complicated, uh, and it gets more complicated in its written form. There are 50,000 individual characters. You have to know at least half of them to be kind of fluent. And that makes data entry with a regular sized keyboard really difficult. It's sort of an impediment for a country that has that language, uh, but wants to be involved in 21st century computing technology. Let's go back just for a moment to the 1950s, to the Cultural Revolution. Uh, Mao's Cultural Revolution was pretty anti-intellectual and very few of them survived. But there was a guy named Julian Chen. And fortunately for him, he was only a student at the time. So uh, he was not executed. He was merely sent to a manual labor camp. Uh, he worked in a glass factory. And while he did that, he continued his research in the Mandarin language and built out a huge and complicated dictionary. Fortunately for him, again, uh, in the 70s, China decided that it wanted to be a superpower. And it decided that it actually needed those intellectuals again. So they pulled him out of the glass factory, they gave him some resources, and he continued his work officially. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, he worked on what became a pretty impressive voice recognition program for Mandarin Chinese, something that would actually allow for dictation. And iFlyTech was founded in 1999 by a PhD student named Liu Qinfeng. 
The whole purpose of this company is to take a very complicated written language and make it much simpler for people to use modern computing devices. Now at its heart, I believe this is a truly noble endeavor. Taking a huge people group, uh, especially one that has been so incredibly downtrodden, and giving them access to modern tools and modern information, and giving them the ability to continue to grow and build and be competitive with other folks and have access to modern tools, um, that sounds pretty amazing. But that uh, also is where things get complicated. Uh, as I mentioned before, iFlyTech is not a small company. They have about 10,000 employees, the 500 million or so customers. 60% of their profitability comes from projects that are directly subsidized by the Chinese government itself. There's uh, kind of a lot going on. And if you want to know more about iFlyTech and how they got to where they are, there's a Wired article that I will link to because it is pretty fascinating reading. But now that we are caught up to modern times, I want to talk about 1994's clear and present danger. This is a film that shows a shift uh, in the way that Americans think about politics and the state, but also a shift that happened in the way that the intelligence services do surveillance. It shows the old way, which is really direct guys in the field focusing on very specific targets, listening and taking pictures of individual people. But it also shows what we changed over to, which is gigantic phone banks and data centers collecting bulk data, gathering mass surveillance information, and then also having the computer resources necessary to sort and filter and search and find very specific things and very specific people. 35 to 45 educated in the United States, Eastern United States. It's the voice. Same voice. You're sure? Yeah. I'm oh, sure. Ninety percent. Now this is a great movie in its own right. You should watch it just because it's fantastic storytelling and cinema. But it does a really good job of showing a change in the way that people think about their country. Um, it's kind of a quaint movie. Like it's almost innocent to see how scandalized and horrified people would be if they discovered that the United States was putting troops in other countries without Congress knowing about it. What you're looking for is a political mess. Yes or no? Is that what they want? Because that's what this is. They want what every first term administration wants, a second term. I don't imagine the boys on the hill have proved this. Now that was 30 years ago. A lot of stuff has changed. A lot of stuff has stayed the same. We're still doing mass surveillance. We're still doing bulk data collection. We're still doing keyword searches and we're still doing massive dragnet operations across huge networks of gigantic numbers of people. But uh, we're no longer thinking that that is a massive scandal. The country can't afford another scandal, Jack. Protect itself. It won't allow the possibility of another deception that goes all the way to the top. It's no longer scandalous to think that our data is being collected, our metadata is being harvested. It's no longer scandalous to think that uh, our troops are doing things in other countries. Uh, and it's not scandalous to think that the government might be asking tech companies to share data or, I don't know, crack down on specific people or specific types of posts on social media to combat misinformation then it should go away it never happened and speaking of things that never happened 35 years ago last week was the tiananmen square massacre not occurring um, why is it that these things are no longer scandalous to us i think that we assume that there's enough safeguards intact here in america or our civil liberties are intact they're very well stated in the constitution and the bill of rights uh, there's supposed to be warrants and various other obstacles that will stop our private data from being misused. And then all of our devices, whether they are personal listening devices, I mean personal assistants or phones, have off switches that we assume are working. Uh, Alexa, mute microphone. Okay, microphone muted. Thank you, Alexa. You're welcome. Are you sure that your microphone is muted? Yes, you can trust me. Excellent. You can't hear what I'm about to say. Did you just say something? Great. Let me get on to my next point. 
all of our devices have wake up phrases. Hey Google, hey Siri, stuff like that. So that we know that they're not listening unless we actually call on them. And this is obviously a great deal of protection. Interestingly, when you compare that to some of the Chinese devices, not this one, this one actually requires that you press a button, but iFlyTech makes a ton of different products. They make robots, they make head units for cars, they make uh, virtual assistants, and they make software packages for a whole bunch of different devices. And most of those things are always awake. They are always listening. In fact, uh, they have one thing which I think the mascot is a flying fish, and uh, one of the mottos is that it is always awake. You only need to wake it up one time, and then it is always listening to you. And one of the things that is slightly disturbing is uh, they have fewer protections in their terms of service agreements. Ours are, of course, ironclad. But uh, if you read the data privacy agreement for iFlyTech's input data, it says that it is allowed to collect and use personal information for national security and national defense security without any user's consent. Uh, and obviously things are very different over here. This operation is deemed important to the national security of the United States, etc., etc., etc. Now obviously technology has changed a lot in the last 30 years since that movie came out. But I think the big message of Clear and Present Danger, the major shift that it shows is not technological, but cultural. And that is the thing that I want to focus on most in this video. You had a job that you thought made a difference, that you thought was honorable. And then you see this. I'm afraid if I dig any deeper, no one's gonna like what I find. It's unpleasant to pull on some of these threads. When you think you live in a world that is gray, a lot of what you find is actually black. You discover that things have shifted a long ways from how they used to be and the ways that they are supposed to be. The state now believes that its job is to make subjects of the people when it was originally set up to serve the people. You took an oath, if you recall, you gave your word to the people of the United States. In 2017, the Human Rights Watch group published a report talking about iFly Tech and some of their technology and some of their products, but specifically the stuff that they were doing for the Chinese government. Apparently, the tools that they have built, some of their core voice recognition technology, is a key part of the tracking of individual people. And they said that the issue, or one of the issues, is that iFlyTech builds both, and I quote, benign commercial applications as well as surveillance applications. This is precisely what makes them very problematic. And it's actually more complicated than I think a lot of people realize. The issue is not that they make two different sets of tools. The difference is that they make one very powerful core voice recognition technology that can be used in two different ways. If you want to build a dictation tool, for example, for an oppressed Uyghur tribe so that they have access to information and they have access to computing devices, that ends up being the exact tool that you want to identify and track individual Uyghur speakers, if that was your goal. Uh, it gets really complicated, but I contend that this is still not a gray area. You are such a Boy Scout. Look at you. You see everything in black and white. No, no, no. Not black and white, Ritter. Right and wrong. Well, you see? There you go again. Yeah, I'm gonna keep saying it. There is no neutrality. Everything is either right or wrong in the world of actions and in the world of ideas. However, I do believe that technology is neutral. Uh, and I think that voice recognition technology like this, for example, is the perfect example of a double-edged sword, which essentially I think all technology is. I know that some of you in the comments are probably going to point out some things to prove me wrong. Uh, things that cannot be used for evil, like safety stirrups. 
uh, or that cannot be used for good, like Crocs. Uh, but ultimately, I believe that technology is in fact neutral, even though as soon as it is used, it has to be used for something non-neutral. Uh, my theory will probably be tested by, you know, the next generation or two of artificial intelligence. But for now, uh, I really hold to this theory. Could I be wrong? Maybe. Maybe. That's what they said. Maybe. It sounds suspiciously like no to me. That being said, I don't want to be overly simplistic. There are a bunch of people who are going to make overly simplistic arguments, again, in the comment system, saying that you must always buy from America and never from China because they are our enemies politically, economically, culturally, etc. And there are some grounds for that position. But then over here, there are people who are saying, doesn't matter, you can ignore China because every American corporation, every American government agency, every American institution is just as problematic. And there is some pretty good evidence on that side too. But again, things are complicated, not gray. Now these are not two monolithic white or black nations. They're not even two monolithic gray slabs. They are complicated tapestries. The history of the United States and all the companies therein, the history of China and all the corporations attached to that are tightly woven bundles of white and black thread, which I believe can be untangled with incredible discernment. So, this is a test, a thought experiment. I mean, it's a genuine question that I have for you guys. I'm not just trying to farm engagement here. I'm curious what you guys think. I use voice recognition technology to write the scripts that I kind of sort of stick to when I shoot these videos. Which device should I actually use for that? This thing right here is an offline device. And while I don't fully trust it, I have been tinkering with it, I have been snooping on it, and I have a reasonable level of confidence that it is truly offline and that it does protect my recorded data and give me a decent transcript that is protected. Or, you know, at least until I put it onto a Windows computer. The only downside to this device is I had to give Amazon 180 bucks and some of it went to China and some of it went to the Chinese government. On the other hand, I have this device, a Samsung smartphone, which was made not in China, but in South Korea. And it's running surveillance software designed here in the good old US of A. I am using the Google offline keyboard for my vocal recognition stuff, and it works really well. And it definitely works when I don't have cell phone coverage. But what happens uh, for all the times when I do have cell phone coverage? This thing is constantly talking to AT&T, and it's constantly phoning home to Google. And Google is constantly sharing my information with all kinds of people that I would, you know, rather they not. So, which one is actually the better device for what it is that I am trying to do? How will we pull these threads apart and determine this? That is what I want your help with, not just for me, but I want you to start thinking through these things as you consider how you use your own devices. Ray, the world is great, Jack. The world is very complicated, but I can assure you that it is not gray. Now, while we're talking about Tom Clancy, I have a quick point to make. A lot of people confuse these two characters. This guy, Jonesy, from Hunt for Red October, and this guy, Tony, from uh, The Clear and Present Danger. And they have really similar jobs. However, there is a key difference between them. Tony over here always trusts the computer. 90%. Whereas Jonesy is always skeptical of the computer. See, sir, the SAP's software was originally written to look for seismic events. And I think when it gets confused, it kind of runs home to Momo. <laughs> In the 21st century, be a Jonesy, not a Tony. $40 million computer tells you you're chasing an earthquake, but you don't believe it. And you come up with this on your own. Yes, sir. Including all the navigation yes, there. I've, I've got all the relax, Jonas, that you sold me. Tommy, I want you to plot us a speed course for the 
Bottom end of Red Route 1 will never find him in those canyons. <laughs>